Hey, it's Karen Kella. And we're back with another episode of the Boozy Bitties. This is the Drink As You Learn School with two longtime friends. And sometimes just two boozy bitties. We're back to butcher the French language today. Yes, we're heading to the south of France today to discuss Languedoc and Roussillon. Grab a glass of wine and drink with us. And I don't even know if I said those things right. So, <laughs> I think you did. Well, I was the one who was about to go in here being Languedoc. And you're like, no, it's Languedoc, like long dick. Yeah, well, only because I just learned that, so... <laughs> So maybe if I knew how to pronounce long a doc better, I would have had a better pun, but it probably just would have been something about <laughs> penises. I don't well, know. It's probably, probably better that you didn't know until you, after you wrote the intro then. Yeah, for sure. So, yep. I, this is really kind of a shame. Not really, but there's so much wine that comes out of this region, but there is so little information about it. Right. I guess maybe it's just like unremarkable in some ways like it's not like a big touristy center I guess if you're going to the south of France you're more going to like the beach than you are to the vineyards I don't know yeah I don't really know (laughs) yeah but this is also though it's becoming I wasn't like knowledgeable enough to like single out this region before but recently I've had quite a few wines from Languedoc in particular some of them just have said like Languedoc hyphen Roussillon because I guess they're you know right next to each other but they're becoming some of my favorites, kind of like the Rhone blends. Yeah, they make the most IGP wines in France. And that is, IGP is like their version of like, t- it's like table wine. You know, it's not, yeah, necessarily the Grand Cru's or whatever, but they make a lot of like the everyday drinking wine. And I think we see a lot more of it in the U.S. that we actually, like you said, like we don't realize it's Languedoc Roussillon, you know, because but it's just kind of everywhere. Like I, you're drinking one of you said a Gerard Bertrand today, and that wine is everywhere. You can find that in every grocery store. Wait, that and- one's that one's pretty easy. And that said, it's um, Cremant de Limo, which is part of Languedoc. But I, again, I never knew that. We've talked about Cremant de Limo before on the podcast because it's it was one of those ones that was a favorite sparkling wine of Thomas Jefferson and all this stuff. So and we'll talk about it a bit more today. But yeah, but it makes. Together, Languedoc and Roussillon, Languedoc's much bigger, makes about 90% of this strip along the Mediterranean coast, and um, Roussillon's 10%, but together they make one out of three French wines that's produced there. So, I mean, I guess I feel like anytime I bought a budget French wine, it's most likely this, and I just never even realized. Possibly. And maybe it's one of those things, too, like, you know, I always say with Italian wines, the same sort of denomination level, the IGTs, like if they bother exporting it, I think it's probably more so in Italy, but if they bother exporting it, then they they have belief in it as an export product. Whereas, you know, the Bordeaux sometimes, I mean, they're, they're good, but they can rely a little bit more on the name recognition of the region for the marketability of the product. But this is also a very innovative wine region. I know you have a lot of notes about the Cremant that they make being, I mean, the oldest sparkling wine in the world. They also were the first people to ever fortify wine, doing it 400 years prior to Portugal, making port. They apparently learned how to grow disease-resistant grapes before other people, (laughs) and they also hosted the first organic wine festival in the world in 1993 that continues every year in Montpellier. Maybe we should try. Let's go to that, too. Okay. (laughs) Add it to the list. (laughs) The the wine list of (laughs) travels. Yeah. (laughs) You're becoming very expensive for me, Kara. Well, we haven't actually done any of it yet. Sure, it's true. It's true. (laughs) So I just, yeah, I just wish there was, this is definitely going to be mini today, but I mean, this is, I think if you want approachable, easy, affordable, delicious French wine, this is what you should be gravitating towards. And it's not quite as scary as trying to figure out the left bank or the right bank of Bordeaux. Right. Definitely not. And similar to the Rhone, they grow some of the same varietals relying on like Syrah and Grenache. They also do Carignan and Mouved a lot. Which I love anything that's like a GSM, a G, sorry, a GSM, <laughs> Kara. <laughs> yeah, I've said that on multiple episodes. I love me a good jism. And <laughs> so I love, obviously, when that, that combination is together. So I think that's probably where I've, I've had the most of from this area. Right. So they do, they do that GSM here, too. Yeah, when we were in Brazil, we actually, you know, went to one of the, like, really nice French restaurants in Sao Paulo. Um, and it's kind of nice because, you know, the American dollar is like five times stronger than the Brazilian Hai. So like you can, you know, get really go to like the nicest restaurants. It's like not a big deal money wise. But um, we got, you know, splurged on a bottle and we were sort of like, you know, we don't know what we're getting. Brazil I don't think is a huge like luxury wine market. So it's sometimes it's hard to find like really nice wine, although Sao Paulo is, you know, really cosmopolitan. But this wine we got was so good. We like 
got a second bottle just like bring back to the hotel room, which we like did not need, but it was a long doc, a long doc Brucio and wine. I wish I had taken a picture of the label, but we were not with our faculties enough to think about doing that. So. <laughs> <laughs> usually when you, yeah, like you said, usually when you get the second bottle of wine to take back, it's not the one you need. The first one has convinced you that you're totally fine and need it. And the second <laughs> one is just like, just kidding. But we were like, this is so tasty. <laughs> and so we, yeah, brought it back. <laughs> but yeah, I, I do remember it was a long doc Brucio and wine. So this one is similar to the other French regions we've talked about recently, like Jura, the Greeks introduced wine to the area in the 5th century BC, and then winemaking proliferated under the Romans. This is a little bit different here is that in the 17th century, we had the construction of this canal du Midi. Again, don't, it's my French, I don't know. <laughs> that one seems pretty straightforward, I would hope. Yeah, I would, I would hope, hope so, but it's, it's probably just like canal du Midi. <laughs> 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 yeah. But it connected the Mediterranean to the Atlantic, so basically that helped with exporting. So it gave a boost to the wine sector in Languedoc Roussillon. And then in the late 19th century, they had the railway system, made it easier to ship wine to northern France, which led to a period of great prosperity. But then also we have phylloxera and same old, same old. So a little bit of the abbreviated history of the region, but it is similar to some of the, the other ones we have spoken about. Aside from the fun part, too, is this Cremant de Limoux was supposedly the first like champ all sparkling wine to employ the traditional champagne method, which I don't know if we can call it the traditional champagne method if it was a traditional limo method. <laughs> did this did champagne just like steal it and then like copyright it? Cause like they did so. it better. <laughs> it does also seem like it's not super well documented. So there might be some contestability as well. Not they were the first wine to use the traditional method of fermentation for the sparkling wine. That said they are undoubtedly the La Blanquette de Limoux is undoubtedly the oldest sparkling wine in the world. And there's written evidence about it from 1531. The monks of St. Hilaire produced Blanquette de Limoux, which is one of their styles of sparkling wine. I don't think I've ever had one of those. Yeah, so it's kind of, they have a few different levels of sparkling wine, it seems like. The original one is a method ancestral. It's a sweeter sparkler made with 100% Monzac grapes. Okay. It's a grape we haven't talked about yet. Yeah. So, and I don't know, like, I didn't have this at my wine store, but they're on filter. They can be cloudy and have distinctive apple notes. And then the next level is this Blanquette de Limo, and that's a wine primarily made of Monzac, which can incorporate small amounts of Chenin, Blanc, and Chardonnay. And that one's like show a ripe green apple sweetness while pouring crystal clear. And then Cremant de Limo, which is what I'm drinking, is a sparkler that falls into the drier, more international style of bubbles. Cremants come in a classic dry style. And also rosé. So mine's actually rosé, although I've had both Gerard Bertrand's, just their regular Cremant de Limo, and this is their rosé one that I'm having today. I like it. I like the Gerard Bertrand stuff. It's it's like price friendly and it's easy to find. Yeah. So this is like 22 bucks. It's super tasty. I actually like would totally have this over some champagnes. Yes. I mean, especially at the price point, but, um, <laughs> but even, consi- even like not taking into consideration the price point, it just is a nice, it has like good flavor. The rosé has a nice little bit of strawberry ness to it. I'm trying to find the notes on it from the internet, but it won't let me into this website because I keep on getting my birth date wrong. Um, okay. But here. <laughs> you, keep, you just keep picking the year wrong or something like that? Uh, yeah. I was like, 2023. They're like, you're not old enough. So. <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> yeah. Because I see mostly, I think I've had a lot of rosés from here too. I didn't know it's the, the biggest producer of AOC rosés in France as well. Right. But that said, I still can't. I was really trying to find one. All I can find at the darn wine store are like Provence rosés. I'm like, okay, like we get it. They're good at making rosés, but I'm kind of sick of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm tired of them. Help. You're tired of them. <laughs> Jesus, Kara. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how you really feel today. <laughs> but anyway, but this one is, uh, you know, since it's a rosé, Pinot Noir grapes, they're not macerated in order to preserve the color. The must is transferred to the vats for the alcoholic fermentation, and they use the same process used for still wine. And then they use malolactic fermentation in the vats. And where does the bubbles come from then? I'm assuming the secondary fermentation? No, they don't tell me about it, though. <laughs> I would assume that would be it. Yeah. Are it, you- tastes, it tastes traditional methody, so I'm assuming, you know, cremants typically have to be, so I'm guessing. Yeah. Oh, you want to hear? Beautiful salmon pink color with glimmering reflections, a complex bouquet with long-lasting aromas of red fruit, strawberry, and raspberry, backed with hints of toasted bread. Toasted bread. I love, love me some of that bread and my alcohol. Yeah. Delicate bubbles and an extraordinary vivacity on the palate with a rich, indulgent texture. Ooh, indulgent. Yeah. Damn, like Karen, long, treat my yourself. My long docks to be indulgent. You <laughs> <laughs> long docks to be indulgent. <laughs> I like to indulge in a good long doc. <laughs> 
See, this is the pun I could have had if I knew how to pronounce it properly at the beginning of the episode. It may be like you said, it is a good thing I didn't know how to pronounce it. I was like, Too many. how the fuck do I make a pun out of Languedoc Rusilion? <laughs> Sorry, there would be way too many dick jokes. Uh, there, yep, we're just getting started, guys. <laughs> just getting started. So that's the Cremant that I, I'm not actually technically drinking right now because we were going to record earlier in the week. So I bought the bottle and I drank it know, already. Drank it. Yeah, but it was tasty. I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I was stocking shelves recently at a grocery store for the chain rollout that I put a lot of Gerard Bertrand on the shelves. So there is my my tie in with it today. Yeah. And at least I can like I know I've bought it at a few different wine stores in the area. So I think they're, you know, one of the ones you can maybe readily find if you're listening to this podcast, you know, anywhere in the States, maybe. Yeah, I mean, that is, what else do we have to (laughs) talk Well, that's Lumo. Well, so I can, well, I don't think we need to go through all of the appellations. I mean, if we want to fill this out into a longer (laughs) episode, we can speak them all. Well, I could speak about, so then if you're looking for like a really affordable, approachable, delicious red blend, this is actually, I think I've mentioned it on the podcast, but I think I maybe said it was a Rhone wine because, again, I didn't really pay attention, even though it says Languedoc right on the front of it. I, I think, you know, not in the Rhone episode, I didn't mention this one, but I think a while back I was trying to remember what my go-to is. So this is actually, it's a 100% Grenache, so it's not a blend, but it's Les Derons from France. Region is languedoc Roussillon, sub-region Languedoc, Languedoc, sorry. <laughs> but I guess Jeff Carell is the producer, and he's a self-proclaimed eclectic winemaker who owns neither a winery nor any vineyards, but crafts some of the best and most interesting wines in southern France. Yeah, again, so it's a Robert Parker favorite. Even Robert Parker's wine advocate says if it came from a more prestigious appellation in the southern Rhone, it would go for three times the price. So there's a saying that because it's the location. God, France is so fucking picky sometimes. Like. Yeah. And actually here, so I knew it was a blend. The top of this website page says varietal Grenache, but then in the middle of the notes, it says 75% Grenache, 20% Syrah, and 5% Carignan. All right. So it's a GSC. A GSC. I have not, I have not had a GSC. There's also, I mean, while the majority of wine coming from Languedoc is still, I think it says there's 93% of the wines produced here are still 5% respectively. There is 2%. They do make a sweet Muscat-based vin du natural. They have some, because I was looking, they have some sweet wine appellations that they designate. There's a few of them. There's four, actually. They all specialize in Muscat, and they're all white, but they also have some sweet wine. But like today, it feels like a good sweet wine day since it's miserable in Denver. Miserable. Well, here it's ninety degrees, so it would be a it would be a bit a perfect day for my Vermont de Limo. <laughs> if you hadn't already drank it, <laughs> yeah, if I hadn't already. But yeah, this so that's I think if you're going to the wine store, the Cremant de Limo is probably pretty easy to find, and I think the red blends are also relatively easy to find. And this one is fifteen dollars, and the web the internet says I don't know where this is. But <laughs> the the internet it, says this. The internet says you could buy it on sale for ten ninety nine. Oh Jesus. <laughs> It's a real bargain, <laughs> um, but no. But it's one, these are one of those ones that, like, when I'm like, eh, I really want red wine, but I don't really want to like drop any money, and I don't really know what I'm in the mood for. This is like a totally easy, just like any n- night of the week, I can just buy this and be happy. Even my husband likes this, and a lot of times he is all picky and only likes his light Italian reds. So this region just is like fascinating to me, just for like the amount of wine it produces. Like I said, this just hard to find information. I'm just like trying to scroll to see what else is going on, but. You know, they account for 11% of the world's production of wine. 11% of the entire world and we can't find like barely any notes on it. Yeah, okay, well, and we that, can't find anything. Fi- there's your 15 minutes. Yeah, on wait, wait, I also got more. I've got more, Kara. Okay. I've got more. <laughs> she did. She found more. It is also home to 36% of French organic vineyards. It's the largest area in France and it is 7% of global organic vineyards. So obviously the organic farming and the organic winemaking is very big for them down here. I feel like France is doing a lot more organic anyway. It seems like it's all this. We've been drinking a lot of like organic and biodynamics recently when we keep buying them. We keep accidentally buying organic or biodynamic. So, but God, 11% of the world's production for just this one region in France seems like a lot. It's like a 10. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's my math for you. It's, it's, it's more than a 10. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, yeah, well we, we really pushed through that one. Yep. Double fist yourselves. Orgasms and alcohol. 